Oh, hey, my name is Zoe Blue, and I created this scene, Biodiversity. I work here at the Compost Education Center. Our mission is to teach people of all ages why composting and soil health are so important. Composting is a way to reduce the amount of food waste that goes into the landfill. It also helps plants and animals, including humans, to grow strong. Here in Victoria, we're on the lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. The Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich nations have cared for these lands for thousands of years. This means that they have a lot of knowledge and respect of the plants, animals, land, and sea that are all around us. The history of these lands is a big reason that I created the Biodiversity Zine. The zine tells the story of five Black and Indigenous peoples. These people loved soil science, food foraging, and economics. I call them ecological stewards. Wait, Zoe, what's an ecological steward? Well, an ecological steward is someone who has a strong connection to the lands they live on. They see themselves as part of a complex system between land, water, and animals. We humans are animals, after all. To be an ecological steward, you must respect all other beings that live also live on the earth. To explain what it means to be an ecological steward, we're going to learn about five people who lived in East Africa, South America, and the United States. In East Africa, a Kenyan woman named Wangari Mathai cared for the health of indigenous trees and indigenous women. When Wangari was a little girl, the British burned down many of Kenya's forests. This event, called the Mau Mau Uprising, left few indigenous trees. Without strong forests, the groundwaters dried up. This change in the landscape left many without access to firewood and fertile lands for farming. The decrease in fertile Kenyan lands left indigenous families hungry and impoverished. Wangari began to teach Kenyan women how to plant trees through a project called the Greenbelt Movement. Through this program, they also learned how to grow nutritious fruits and vegetables. This movement encouraged Kenyans in the army, public schools, and farms to plant indigenous trees. Kenyans used those trees for firewood and building materials. While this happened, places like the Abadare Forest began to thrive. This was great because it lessened the chances of land degradation. Uh, what's land degradation? Land degradation is a change in the land's ability to grow plants and support the lives of animals. The land can be infertile forever or for a short amount of time. But this change also means that the land is of no use to human beings. Through her movement, Wangari showed us that the health of the forest mirrors the health of the people. Kenyan families grew trees for their own use, and the indigenous forests were able to keep growing and protecting the groundwater. So forests don't need humans to do well? Well, yes and no. Forests, like everything on Earth, were created to work in balance with their surrounding ecosystem. But when a part of the forest is taken away, humans can help restore balance. The removal of trees meant the groundwater dried up in Kenya. The people began protecting the trees and the groundwater began to come back. So you see, forests don't need humans to do well, but our relationship with forests is very important. Let's go to Brazil and I'll explain another special relationship between forests and humans. In 1944, a man named Francisco Chico Alves Mendes Fijo was born. The world came to know him as Chico Mendes. Like his father, and his father's father, Chico worked in the Amazon rainforest as a rubber tree tapper. For a long time, rubber trees were the only way humans could make things like balloons and car tires. The rubber tree tappers and indigenous nations of the Amazon depended on the health of the rainforest to survive. This is because many people lived off the rainforest fruit and nut trees. Cattle ranching and industrial agriculture threatened their livelihoods. Both of those industries needed clear-cut forests to work. Chico worked hard to protect a certain part of the Amazon from those destructive industries. Chico's protection of this land is an example of an extractive reserve. Chico's life work showed us that in some cases, plants and animals, and that includes humans, need each other. Chico protected the forest, but the forest also made sure to provide his community with work and food. These stories of Chico and Wangari show us the connection between human beings and nature. 
When we start to understand the pieces of nature that keep us alive, our appreciation can grow. Being an ecological steward doesn't mean we must wake up tomorrow and save every forest single-handedly. It means that we consider what our communities need and the small ways that we can help. Two people that have looked at how small actions in the soil can have a big impact are agronomists named Jane Mount Pleasant and George Washington Carver. Uh, Zoe Blue, what's an agronomist? Well, an agronomist is a fancy word for someone who studies the health of the soil and how well that soil grows crops. To understand why agronomy is important, let's take a trip to upstate New York or Haudenosaunee lands where Jane's from. Jane looked at the importance of the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash, and mound farming. Some anthropologists and archeologists believed that indigenous farming was unstable and damaging to the environment. Jane showed them wrong with the help of science. During her time as a professor of horticulture at Cornell University, Jane showed that beans, corn, and squash grow through a special relationship with one another. Indigenous people learned about this relationship through thousands of years of trial and error. Indigenous nations like the Haudenosaunee use mound farming to grow three sisters. Corn grows tall while squash creeps along the ground protecting corn and bean from unwanted plants. Bean grows up corn's tall stalk and when the bean plant dies, its roots break down and leave a surplus of nitrogen in the soil. Nitrogen fixation is the name of this process. The mound farming system developed by Jane's ancestors is better than industrial agriculture. This is because it holds on to moisture, builds the ground's fertility level, and maximizes the surface area that the crop grows on. Jane pushed back against the idea that indigenous farming is worse than Western farming. Jane's research can help us non-indigenous folks garden and care for our plants in the same way that they've been looked after for thousands of years. Thanks, Jane. Our other agronomist, George, worked in Alabama around 1896. He taught at a historically black university known as Tuskegee Institute. George lived during a time when land fertility was a problem for many farmers. Black farmers had a difficult time with land degradation because of the cost of their land and fertilizer for their crops. The problem was that after years and years of planting one crop, cotton, and over tilling their land, the soil's health worsened. George addressed this problem with the Jessup Agricultural Wagon. The wagon traveled to poor black farming communities to teach cheap solutions to soil degradation. The first solution was to compost. Farmers used the scraps from their crops and animal poo to fertilize next season's crops. It also came at no cost. Composting builds up your topsoil by adding vitamins and minerals that plants need to grow. The second solution was crop rotation with a nitrogen fixer. But instead of beans, George told the farmers to grow peanuts. Farmers would plant cotton, then plant peanuts right after harvesting the cotton. After they harvested the peanuts, their roots left nitrogen in the soil. In the next season, the cotton used the nitrogen to grow strong. This is an example of a style of regenerative agriculture. It can be found in many forms all over the world. Okay, okay. Regenerative agriculture is pretty cool, but what did the farmers do with all of those peanuts? Great question. George invented 300 different uses for peanuts, including peanut flour, peanut wood stain, a type of peanut butter, and peanut skin lotion. This meant that poor farmers had two crops instead of one that made them good money for a low cost. In Jane and George's cases, ecological stewardship meant innovation. Both of them showed us the ways that modern science and traditional farming knowledge can come together to improve the lives of farmers. Ecological stewardship can come in so many different forms. The last example of a BIPOC ecological steward is my personal favorite. She is a woman who traveled around the eastern United States and Canada during the 1800s. Her name is Harriet Tubman. Uh, Zoe Blue, we know Harriet. She rescued hundreds of black folks from slavery and was the first black woman to serve in an American army. How is she an ecological steward? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. Harriet had many valuable skills. She was brave and cunning, but most importantly, she was a survivalist. During her time as a spy on the Underground Railroad, rescuing slaves and stuff, Harriet had to keep the people she rescued sped and alive. She did this by foraging for food and medicines in the forest. Harriet would feed people black cherries and sassafras and make medicines to heal injuries while guiding them to freedom. Harriet wasn't the only spy on the Underground Railroad either. Many others kept hundreds alive through their knowledge of the natural landscape they traveled through. Phew, that was a lot of information. I'm guessing you're wondering what all of that history has to do with you. Well, ecological stewards aren't just scientists or people who lived a long time ago. Ecological stewards are all around us. And now that you've learned about five very different ecological stewards, it's time for you to think of your own. To figure out who might be an ecological steward in your life, ask yourself these questions. Do you know anyone who shows care for land, water, and animals? Do you know anyone who has a relationship with a natural environment that has lasted a long time? Do you know anyone who shows others how to care for the land? Do you know someone who shows respect for land, water, and animals around them? And lastly, do you know someone who understands that human beings are not better than land, water, and animals, but an equal part of them? If you know anyone who shows these qualities, pick up your copy of Biodiversity and write about them in the My Ecological Steward section of the booklet. Thanks for taking this time to hear about some ecological stewards that I think are pretty cool. Until next time, I'm Zoe Blue, and this has been a video made by the Compost Education Center and CR Fair's Good Food Summit. Goodbye!